my name is Oliver Blockland, the Senior Conference Producer at Global Investor Group. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the, the ISF and Islam Securities Finance Webinar Series. Today's session is entitled Capital Markets, Union and Liquidity. On behalf of myself, ISF and ISLA, I'm pleased to see so many of you have joined us here today. Uh, I'd like to thank our 17 sponsors, their logos are, are up on the holy side for their continued support and who've made this event possible. Do please go to the content hub at the microsite where you register to learn more about genuine thought leadership and view white paper materials. In today's one hour web conference, we will have a panel discussion of around 50 minutes and we have set aside some time for Q&A. We already received a few questions for our panelists, so if you wish to ask a question, you can do so by clicking the Q&A button. So do keep sending through your questions for the panel, and we'll try to answer as many as we can by the end of the session. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the speakers and moderators for sharing with us your time and thoughts on the topics we will be discussing today. The session is being recorded, and it is now my great pleasure to introduce Ed Oliver. Oliver, thank you. Um, it's very, uh, very uh, pleasurable for me to be here, um, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, I'm delighted to be moderating a panel that is uh, particularly well timed and introduces panelists that have a unique perspective and also don't necessarily address our industry uh, very often either. So, um, great to hear from them this morning. It's not a panel of practitioners, um, we heard from them on Tuesday. Uh, but some of the comments from Tuesday's panel we'll definitely be considering during the upcoming hour. In fact, um, one commented on Tuesday that uh, as a result of COVID-19 and the need for economic recovery, the EU has reprioritized ESG and CMU as important elements in leading that recovery. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that particular point in a short while with our panellists, but let, let's get uh, our panellists introduced. So first of all, I'm pleased to have Tanya Panova, um, Head of Unit for Capital Markets Union at the European Commission. Michael Hurtus, he's partner and co-head of the Financial Institutions Regulatory Practice for Europe at Denton's. And Ilsa Peters, Head of Government Relations and Public Affairs at Euroclear. Um, so some good perspectives, as you can understand. So Tanya is front and centre of the regulatory rulemaking in the EU. Ilsa representing an organisation with a footprint across many EU locations and needing to respond to the regulatory agenda. And Michael, whose day job is advising organisations on how to navigate regulation. So lots of different perspectives. Now, many of us don't get out of bed these days for anything less than a four-letter acronym. Um, there are, inevitably going to be many of them over the next 60 minutes. So you're going to hear some of our favourites for this industry. So SFTR, CSDR, Basel IV, USITS, and we'll also talk about short selling and liquidity. Um, so lots of, uh, lots of our favourite subjects, certainly hot ones for this industry right now. Um, but to get us started, Tanya, I wanted to come to you. Um, the regulatory landscape, landscape in, in Europe can be um, a little bit complicated for some of us who are new to it. Um, there are many players. You've got the Parliament, the Commission, ESMA, the National Competent Authorities, the NCAs. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in if you could lay out how this holds together and how uh, regulation is, is made across those um, constituents. But also, if you could also comment on the, um, the uh, observation from Tuesday that uh, the CMU is a key element in leading the EU's economic recovery. Just be interested in your thoughts on that, too. So good morning. Uh, my name is Talia Panova. I represent the European Commission, the European body that proposes legislation and uh, has the task of steering also policy discussions. To recall, uh, five years ago, the Commission started a capital market union project. Uh, of course, uh, even though the name was new, the objective was not new. Um, the objective to build a single market for capital dates back perhaps to the Treaty of Rome. However, the discussion got the renewed momentum under the last commission um, as um, a need has been identified to complement, let's put it this way, the a more integrated mar market for, for banking uh, with a more integrated market for capital in an objective to create uh, a European, a true European monetary union. 
At the time, it became clear that while the banking sector was getting increasingly integrated, capital markets remained very fragmented. So there was London, of course, uh, there was Paris, there was Frankfurt, Amsterdam, uh, there, there were Scandinavian markets, but at the same time, each time there was a strong home bias, um, companies were still not able to reach out across um, boundaries to other member states. In particular, an issue was acute for member states with less developed capital markets to reach more liquid and more efficient markets established in other member states. So the project started with the Commission uh, publishing the so-called green paper, so the, the paper or the, the document that was supposed to kick off the discussions, the wider policy discussions amongst stakeholders, um, as to how uh, the action plan, how the action plan should be developed for putting in place the capital market team. The action plan that followed um, included a lot of legislative and non-legislative proposals. For legislative proposals, uh, of course, we would have to go, and we did go through the established call legislative decision-making process. So in many cases, it was the so-called ordinary legislative procedure based on the qualified majority voting by council and parliament. In some areas, uh, such as tax, uh, of course, this is based on a different procedure and requires unanimity in council, making also agreement on these proposals much more complicated. So then, back in 2017, the focus has slightly changed. Uh, we've got new developments, we've got Brexit, we've got the uh, reiterated, or, or let's say, renewed political urgency for green and digital transformation. All of this uh, had to be incorporated in the reviewed strategy for the EU. All in all, CNU 1.0, if I may call it that way, um, had about 70 legislative and non-legislative initiatives, out of which 13 legislative ones had to be agreed by Council and Parliament. 12 of them were agreed. Uh, one is still outstanding. Um, this is the proposal that deals with conflicts of laws with respect to third party facts in assignment of claims and is mostly in the remit of justice ministers. So most of these proposals, if we look back, sought to remove cross-border barriers, introduce some kind of investment vehicles to make it easier for people to also pass border across borders. Um, they also introduce a more proportionate regulatory treatment for companies and financial intermediaries. At least one of them sought to build a more integrated and convergent supervisory landscape. So while the Commission proposes rules, of course, Council and Parliament um, have to negotiate and agree on them, uh, adopt them, um, then the rules would have to be implemented and enforced on the ground. So the trick is to implement and enforce them in a way that does not give rise to regulatory arbitrage. If supervision is not rigorous across the whole union, it incentivizes companies to move around based on considerations related to how strong or perhaps not strong supervision is, rather than where uh, investment opportunities are better. This is why coordination and convergence of supervisory outcomes uh, becomes essential. At the moment, uh, the three European supervisory authorities, uh, including ASMA, which is the key authority uh, for the capital markets, takes most of the decisions um, related to uh, supervision, supervisory convergence uh, in the so-called Board of Supervisors. This Board of Supervisors consists of individual national authorities, competent authorities. The use of some of the tools that um, ASMA has um, and uh, already ha has had for quite some time, like the launch of peer reviews, like the breach of law procedures. So the, the processes that actually contribute to, to more convergent supervisions that allow for supervisory authorities to identify where supervisory outcomes are not identical and then therefore work towards ma making them more identical or more convergent. Uh, so the use of those tools actually uh, rely on the uh, ability of this board of supervisors consisting of national competent authorities to actually agree on launching those 
process and so on using those tools. Now the 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 problem is, however, that this board of supervisors consists of those uh, national competent authorities against whom uh, some of these procedures will be opened. So what is essential, therefore, uh, in this overall uh, landscape is to ensure that um, these decisions are taken when uh, there is a need and that uh, supervision is therefore uh, increasingly convergent um, as a result. Um, that requires the, the right safeguards to ensure that uh, national interests do not prevail over European interests. And that was part of the underpinning rationale for the ESA's review when the Commission proposed it. Of course, this review was also one of the most politically sensitive reviews, um, or politically sensitive uh, legislative proposals that triggered um, a, a lot of discussions um, among member states. We all know what, uh, what was the outcome of this. Um, let's see whether uh, the new starting and new developments in the market would uh, be conducive to uh, another debate on supervision uh, or whether um, we need to wait for another momentum to, to appear. Uh, with this, um, I, I would like to close my remarks, uh, introductory remarks. I'm more than happy to engage with all of you and panelists. Um, and this is a sequence Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. So is it is it fair to say, because I think um, we see in our industry that occasionally the NCAs have slightly different um, interpretations of the rules set out by ESMA. Um, and also, I, I guess for you, um, representing a bank that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, has a footprint in many EU locations, working with many NCAs, do you see that there is, um, although obviously everyone's trying to get to consistent regulation in Europe, do you see that there are differences between NCAs and, and how do you handle that? Um, I want to specifically uh, focus on the on the piece of regulation that we have been looking at at Euroclear over the last years, which is uh, the CSDR. And um, it is interesting to see that it was, it was a piece of legislation, basically, that was not coming out of the financial crisis. So it's not a result of, of the 2008 crisis, but it is, in fact, uh, what Tanya referred to as a single market objective was the first aim uh, of CSDR. Um, so uh, and within C CSDR, you see all the components that, that we basically have in CMU, uh, because it has three basic objectives. There is the financial stability objective, which obviously as a financial market infrastructure, you would want us to be safe and sound. I think that's an obvious one, and I think I'll park that for a moment, because I think it's largely achieved. There's harmonization. There's a couple of harmonization topics in CSDR, uh, the, 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 the change to the T plus 2 or the harmonization of the T plus 2 settlement cycle <clears throat> is the first one. It's implemented. The next one is all known to, to you best probably is a settlement discipline regime, including the famous buy-in. It's an element of harmonization. I'll park that to later because I'm sure there will be questions on that. And then the last part is really how to make uh, the CSD world more competitive because CSDs, you know, there's still over 30 CSDs in Europe. That is not what Europe needs. It needs probably competition consolidation. And it is in that area where CSDR injected elements for CSDs to start competing. And you would hope that as a result of the implementation of CSDR, that competition starts. But what we have seen in practice is that in the implementation of CSDR, basically, we have seen that the national competent authorities all took, I would say, the excuse of CSDR to make CSDs ever so national again. So we are a horizontal group. We have seven CSDs in the group. So you would think we can bring some synergies uh, by doing some group services to ensure that there is more efficiency. Well, as a result of CSDR, we had to undo some of them. Uh, and that is the result of the interpretation, not of the text itself, but of the interpretation of the national competent authorities, which is really unfortunate. So it has made us undo synergies rather rather than, than increase. And I'm sure we'll talk about the CSDR review, which is part of the CMU action plan. And so this is an element probably that, that is, that is an, uh, I would say, a candidate 
uh, to see how we make CSDs really competitive. Thanks, Ilsa. It's a fair point. So what you're saying is this is sort of the if you set out with the objective of trying to do something uh, centrally and have convergence of regulation, what you're basically suggesting is that's not what's being achieved with CSDR. So, Tanya, is that frustrating for you to hear that uh, or is that really what you know you recognise does occur? And that's the whole purpose of this supervisory committee that you mentioned earlier. Well, I, I think there, there is a limit to how much uh, regulators can do or legislators can do. So I think uh, rules are, are good as, uh, you know, if, if, if they can uh, provide some, some guiding principles for, for stakeholders and for supervisors, basically, how, how these rules should be, should be applied. But then a lot, um, you know, is, is, is really to do with how these rules are applied in practice and how uh, they are enforced in practice. I think the role of European supervisory authorities and AFMA in this specific case is extremely important in providing guide, guidelines, guidance basically to national authorities to ensure that they, they apply them all in, in the same way and that the spirit, the legislative spirit, because we, we can talk about, you know, nitty gritty and every single individual rule, but I think what is much more important is the spirit of each legislative proposal. And as Ilza was saying, the spirit of CSDR was precisely to ensure that we, you know, we introduce the CSD pass, but we, we allow CSDs to compete across markets to provide settlement services across markets and this is the legislative spirit of, of, of CSDR. So if there are national interpretations that really challenge that legislative intent embedded in CSDR, then I think we do have a problem and I think this problem needs to be tackled. That's why I think the high level forum on, on CMU has identified this and specifically the provision of cross-border settlement services as one of the issues that the next CMU should be looking into. Yeah, um, I mean, we'll come back and talk a little bit more detail about CSDR in a bit. So I think sort of now we're establishing the sort of regulatory framework. Michael, um, morning to you. Um, what's your thoughts on, on just sort of final thoughts on regulatory divergence if there exists? And I think, you know, just picking up one of the observations from the panel on um, Tuesday, I mean, they were talking about Brexit and we're not going to really be covering that during this panel. But one observation from, from one of the panelists that actually rather than celebrating for example, the UK announcement that they'd not be um, enacting CSDR. Regulatory divergence is actually painful. Um, what, what's your thoughts on that, Michael? Sure, thank you, and good morning to everyone. Um, I think just touching on a couple of things, um, obviously CMU is um, basically, the, the aims and the goals that were behind the investment services directives um, way before we had method and way before we had method two, so in many ways, a lot of the building blocks are there. Um, the key difference now, as opposed to 2020, as opposed to um, CMU 1.0, is that Europe has evolved, Europe has changed. The supervisory environment has changed um, drastically. So within um, the Euro area, we have banking union, which is certainly uh, going to the point that Tanya has made, has come leaps and bounds to streamline some of the national options and discretions in most of the banking space um, and effectively uh, reduce some of the regulatory divergence within the 19 member states that make up the banking union. And the whole premise behind that, of course, is if you have to have or if you are aiming for a single rule book for the single market for financial services, you also need to build a single supervisory culture. And with the review of the powers and mandates of the European Supervisory Authority, so ESMA and EA, um, some leaps and bounds have gone towards doing that. And part of that is really from, um, first of all, moving more towards the use of more re regulation as opposed to directives, um, greater use of regulatory technical standards to push for harmonization, but more importantly, and this is something, um, apologies, Ed, we said we wouldn't touch upon the B word, but um, <laughs> one, of the, one of the game changers, if you want, um, due to the, the changing dynamic of the UK, um, has been that the European supervisory authorities uh, have pushed for supervisory expectations. So effectively, um, guidelines which uh, are on a comply or explain, and if you don't comply, then you find um, explanation quite difficult, um, pushes towards that greater sense of harmonization. So I think 
Within the EU27, there's a, um, a recognition that more needs to be done together. And we're seeing already that certain national competent authorities are saying, look, I'm never really going to be the center of excellence on SFTR issues in my market. But through the, um, the network of national competent authorities and through ESMA sitting at the head of that, um, and, and ESMA increasingly becoming a federal supervisor, if you want, um, there is an ability to, um, to leverage off that and apply best practice. Now, that's not something that happens overnight. As we know, um, financial markets regulation and harmonization is an ongoing journey. It's always uh, in, in room for improvement. But I think the, um, the, the, the change in tune, which we've been predicting for some time um, from ISLA conferences uh, many years ago, um, to say that the UK will, will take its own path um, is really putting feet to the, to the fire at certain authorities and policymakers to say, look, um, if we want to preserve financial stability and if we want to preserve the European um, aspect of doing things, then we need to be joined up with 27 plus voices in order to make sure that there is um, at least within the single market a true single market. So the risk of divergence and supervisory convergence as a, as a priority area has been on the agenda of all the European supervisory authorities as well as the ECB um, for the past five years. Um, five years, if you want, is still very much in baby step uh, territory for um, creating a single market. And coming back to CMU, if you look at the CMU, um, the green paper, which Tanya touched upon, the action plan, the high level forum, to be honest, doesn't do as much as, uh, it doesn't refer as much as the previous papers does, but the benchmark standard of integration is effectively North American capital markets, right? And if you look at the difference, what, what's been achieved in five years is already given the political climate and COVID and so on is quite, um, quite quite welcome in, in, in many ways, but if you compare that to the United States and, and, and the path that's taken in the United States, it's taken 70 plus years to get to the level of integration that Europe is going to. So there's a leapfrog effect. I think the, the high level forum does tackle um, a lot of the issues head on um, that CMU 1.0 said, let's go out and consult upon. And a lot of the, I think the sense in the market was that there was too much consultation on CMU 1.0 and CMU 2.0 is, is saying, okay, this is the way forward and this is commission, you, need, you now need to get things done. Um, so that's, uh, or commission and other um, parts of the decision-making process you need to get things done. So I think we really do have um, a watershed moment for, um, for the future of certainly the acronyms that are, relevance to this stakeholder group, but certainly further here. Thank you, Michael. Um, I mean, before we sort of move on to some of those specific acronyms, um, I just wondered, Ilso, I've had a question um, come in, and, and thank you to everyone who's sending questions in. Use the, uh, the Q&A button on the, uh, on, on the app. But um, uh, if we want harmonization across Europe, do we want multiple CSDs all competing with each other? Um, what, what are your thoughts? Um, I think the, the the level of competition that CSDs can do for the moment is, is it, it, there is some level of competition that CSDs can do, but there is so much unharmonized that it is still need to do first a lot of harmonization. It, to name to name one, which is known to everybody, but we have different holding models across Europe. We have omnibus account structures, we have end investor account structures, and CSDR has been done with the intent to maintain the current CSD models. Now, that doesn't compete very easily. There are other, so my view is that there is a need for more harmonization still for CSDs to compete effectively. And so to come back to the discussion on the supervisory elements, my personal view is that you first need to go for more harmonization before you can consider going, for instance, for a single supervisor, because otherwise the single supervisor will never be able to, I mean, we'll only have a thin layer of commonalities across the CSDs, an important one, but still a thin, and you still have so much local specificities 
on corporate actions, on withholding tax, on, on securities law, that it makes it very difficult for a single supervisor to have a view on all that. So I would rather say first harmonize more, then there is more competition, and then you may take the step to have, for instance, a single supervisor. But the other way around, I don't think will work. That's my my view. Okay, thank you, Elsa. Um, Tanya, did you have any other comments to add before we sort of move into some of the specific regulations that we're focused on? Well, I, I, th I think I, 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 I agree both with, with Michael, I think also partially with, with Ilse. Um, I think what is relevant in this context is, of course, to make sure that, um, you know, rules are the same or rules are, um, you know, that we, we limit, in fact, national national discretions and uh, tackle the barriers. Uh, I think this is this is what what Ilza was referring to with, with withholding tax and corporate actions. And indeed, I think the forum has proposed a few things in in, in that respect. So I I do see why Ilza you're saying that you know we we need to have a single. This is how they they've also tried to do it in in banking, right? So. Um, but at the same time, you you do have CRD and you have CRR, so you, you do have certain elements which are you know which are capped in in the directive, and nonetheless you do have SSM uh, that supervises the um, sort of more more systemic banks, which could in a way be uh, a potential um, way forward for supervision of capital market uh, stakeholders where. You know, you you kind of embark on parallel track, and in, in, you know, on the one hand, you you build this single rule book because I couldn't agree more with Elder saying that you know this is this is essential. Building, you know, a move towards more regulations, directly applicable regulations, would limit the supervisory discretion and interpretation to the maximum, and this is essential. This is one. And then potentially also starting reflection on, you know, where we've got systemic risk, which are the systemic uh, companies that might benefit uh, from from this more pan-European supervision. Which which brings us nicely to a question we've had in about does does the CMU benefit larger global system system I can never say this word, systematically important financial institutions. Thank you for whoever asked that question. More than regional entities, uh, particularly in Southern Europe. So does the CMU benefit the larger organisations, basically? Tanya. Whether it, it's, it, it, it is for me, okay. I, I, I um, <laughs> I don't. I don't think CMU is just. Uh, this is this is the criticism that we hear a lot. That CMU is largely, you know, about big ones and, you know, the, creates benefits only for the big ones. Um, I, I think what CMU does, because by definition it removes cross border barriers, right? So the big ones who have the scale, of course, who have the ability to reach out to new markets and to offer services across a wider, let's say, geographical area. At the same time, by them doing so, uh, we, you know, we, we're having efficiencies. We ha we're having economies of scale. We, we hopefully, if, if there is also competitive pressure, have all of this uh, trickling down in lower fees and lower costs. And this is where maybe smaller uh, stakeholders stand to benefit. This is where companies, uh, you know, local companies stand to benefit, because, um, you know. Uh, I, I think you, you can have benefits at, at all levels, and while the big ones would have the benefit of, of the scale, the smaller ones would have the benefit of, of let's say, cost efficiency potentially, and also, uh, you know, ability to connect onto markets which, uh, you know, are, are more liquid and um, deeper because of, let's say, intrinsic inability of certain markets potentially to to become, you know, cities of this world or Londons of this world. So I don't think we, we could have 27 Londons. Um, I don't think we need 27 Londons. But I think what we do need, we need adequate ecosystem. And CMU is about breadth as it is about depth. I think what is important is to make sure that there is adequate ecosystem in every, let's say, member state. But then beyond that, there is connectivity. There is the ability to provide services across the border, you know, uh, by those undertakings who can do it 
better, who can do it more cheaply, who can do it more efficiently. So I would say uh, big ones, yes, but uh, I think there are lots of benefits for smaller ones as well. Great. Thank you, Tanya. Um, let's let's start flipping through the CMU roadmap now, and, and just a little plug for ISLA here, because um, there's a really nice graphic on the ISLA website that shows the upcoming regulation over the next two or three years. So, um, if anyone wants to sort of get a sense of what's coming, then uh, do do take a look at the ISLA website and look at that. Um, let's talk about CSDR mm -hmm. in a bit more detail then, because we've already touched on it. It's obviously a hot topic for this industry right now. Um, there's lots of feedback, lots of advocacy going on. Um, I'm just going to run through a few different themes that we, we've seen. We've got, you know, the industry associations earlier this year writing a letter to, to ask for a delay. Um, we've got lots of conversations. Also, you've already mentioned it about the buy-in regime. Can that be taken out? Um, we've got suggestions of a test period where fines would be reported but not collected. Um, and most recently, there's been the CSDs themselves asking for a delay um, from the current February 2021 implementation date. Um, plus, of course, there's a consultation out there right now just assessing the, 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 the preparedness of the industry. Where's this going to end up? Ilsa, what's, what's your thoughts? What's, what's, going, to, where, where, what's going to happen with this? Um, first of all, we all know that uh, the CSDR settlement discipline regime at the time CSDR was finalized was rushed through. So it was not something that had been thought through carefully. I was there at the time. I know how fast it went. Uh, it went in two, three weeks. The, the text was there, um, according to me, without uh, enough impact assessments. Uh, so, so, but, but that's well. That 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 was 2014. So, um, we. I mean, from, of course, this is a post-trade uh, regulation. But we understand there is quite some impact on more the front office on the trading uh, on the trading side. We we've understood that from 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 the start. Um, now I know that industry associations have been trying first not have by the buy-in regime, have it revised, have it delayed, to date, unsuccessfully. Um, I, that that's what I understand. The latest reply letter from ESMA clearly indicated that. Um, it is true that. CSDs very recently, uh, we have addressed a request to the European Commission to delay the implementation of settlement discipline regime. It is mostly about what I call our part of the settlement discipline regime, which is the settlement penalties, etc. Uh, and it is really entirely COVID-19 related uh, because we, we have been, as financial market infrastructures, our focus over the last months has been op operational resilience. Uh, which has, uh, well, with the, with the volumes at some point in time that were there, and as you know, with with the high uh, degree of settlement fails as well, uh, the attention of the of the resources was was for months uh, mostly there uh, on, on on the operational resilience and ensure that the customers were well served, uh, and so it it basically brings uh, us to say, well, we cannot implement all. So this is the main reason. I mean, there are other reasons. We don't have all guidance yet from uh, ESMA or the Commission, so there is still rules missing. Um, and that has brought us to ask for a delay of one year uh, in the implementation. Uh, to date, uh, we, we do not know if this, if this delay will be given. We are hopeful it will be given. I think it, we didn't receive to date any negative uh, indication. Um, but what we could all hope for, I believe, is that uh, if the delay is granted, uh, it may give some air to, you know, there's a CSDR review upcoming. Uh, we believe that in general, the review will be limited to a number of parts. I mean, at, at least that's what we would want is, is a limited review uh, of CSDR, or for instance, on the passporting. But who knows uh, that the review could be taken as, uh, I would say, an, an excuse or a possibility to also review the buy-in regime, because I think the recent formal uh, decision by the UK not to implement a settlement discipline regime in the UK version of CSDR is probably also an element that the Commission ought to take into account. Uh, is it all, after all, uh, a good a good decision? Now, from a CSD perspective, we've we've never taken a really I would say active stance in the buy-in regime because it's it's not really affecting us. But although we understand the market's concern, but 
well, let, let's hope that what I just painted is an option and uh, that, that there is more time granted first, that, that I think everybody would already applaud, but also that that interim period would be um, used uh, to look at, at, at the, the buy-in regime uh, in specifically and maybe taking into account figures on what happened in March and April uh, in the markets uh, where we have seen a quite exceptional period. And I think it would merit some analysis of that period on settlement efficiency, et cetera, to see what would a buy-in regime have done, or even a penalties regime, would, what, what would have happened. So I, that, that, that's the way I, I hope it, it could, it could, it could uh, come out. Tanya, um, straight into you with, uh, <laughs> with comments on that. Sure. Um, we're listening with, with a lot of interest to, um, to Ilza's uh, intervention. Uh, maybe just um, first uh, a small short remark on, on, on the UK um, and their statement. Um, I think indeed the, the considerations of competitiveness are important. We want to have a competitive industry and uh, of course, uh, regulatory treatment uh, is, is part of that consideration. At the same time, I would warn uh, everyone that, uh, you know, regulatory competition is not always a good thing, uh, because I think we can very easily end up in a sort of the so-called race to the bottom um, and not race to the top situation where we are competing, you know, in terms of uh, who basically puts in place uh, easier or, or, or more deviated rules while losing sight of the bigger picture. So I think this is this is probably a word of caution for me um, and without prejudice to to the objective, more more rushing objective of ensuring that uh, European industry, including you know in the area of, of settlement, the provision of settlement services, remains to be competitive. This is maybe one point. Uh, number two, uh, more specifically on CSDR and, and the settlement discipline. So, um, of, of course, we we probably would need to to consider the, the whole history of of, of that file. Um, the settlement discipline has already been uh, delayed for for two years, right? The the implementation. So this is something that um, was not just kind of thrown into industry and the industry had to comply with immediately. So there was already a delay of two years, right? Um, then just recently, I think there was another extension um, which was uh, also justified, I think, or well, the industry has provided um, elements um, and ASMA therefore had uh, issued a favorable uh, opinion and then it was also confirmed by the Commission that uh, a, a limited uh, an, a, another limited extension of the deadline uh, so from September to February is, is again justified so there is yet another extension if you wish uh, on top of this two years extension that we have had. Uh, now I understand that COVID comes on top and COVID perhaps changes things. Um, you've mentioned a high number of uh, settlement failures. This is of course um, an important consideration and of course um, I think trying to see again sort of the, the, the requirements that the new settlement discipline would would uh, make CSDs to comply with, and you know what kind of um, you know potential burden and cost we're talking about if the industry had to comply with all of the requirements in the settlement discipline. This is of course a very uh, very important debate to to be had. Uh, but I think this debate, as you've said, Ilza yourself, needs to be based on data. So I think uh, what we've seen a lot from 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 the industry, if I may. There were lots of statements. It's hard. It's difficult. It's impossible for us to put in place. There will be consequences. But I think, you know, each each time, uh, if I may, there was a bit of shortage of evidence. And I know it's difficult to put forward evidence for something that is not yet in place, uh, and demonstrate that yes, indeed, it would have far-reaching uh, implications. I think when you operate with, with, with data, and here perhaps COVID, uh, okay, it's, it's, it's a disastrous thing, but I think it, uh, in, in certain way, it allows us to 
you know, to 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 have to to have data around how you know markets perform in certain circumstances, circumstances of stress, extreme stress, you know, uh, stress liquidity. Um, so this number should be analysed, and I think indeed it seems um, it will take against what is uh, the settlement discipline would bring, let's say, um, to to the industry. So I, I agree with you that. This this merits uh, a discussion. However, I perhaps would challenge um, the, the statement that you know the, the, it was rushed um, on, onto the industry because I think we we're already going through several iterations of extension. So um, let's have this debate, but uh, let's also be mindful of the fact that it's been already um, quite some time since the, the debate has started. And just maybe one last point: uh, the high-level forum actually couldn't agree on 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 the inclusion of the of the recommendation on the uh, mandatory buying. Uh, for one simple reason, because there was a disagreement at the table. There were some members who said, absolutely, we need to, you know, turn buying into an optional buying as opposed to mandatory. It should be the choice, basically, for you to uh, to, to to seek cash um, at the end as opposed to a physical settlement. Um, and others who said, no, no, it, it, it should be, it should be mandatory and it should be true for everyone. So, you know, and of course the later view didn't come from, from CSDs, but came from another side. Um, but I think it, it is important to, to remain open to the views of both sides. So there is the, the story that, you know, of CSDs and there's the story um, of those who, who are the clients of CSDs and perhaps see things differently. So I think what is important for us as policymakers is to ensure that we, um, we get to the right balance, you know, uh, keeping things reasonable and keeping our in industry competitive also in light of Brexit, but at the same time ensuring that there is, um, you know, value to clients and clients get the right protection. So with this, I'm, I'm stopping. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. Um, I appreciate uh, the feedback. Um, also, I don't know whether you had any follow-up comments on that that you wanted to chime in with before I, I jump to Michael just to get, get his thoughts. Yeah, at, at the settlement layer, at our layer, we do have data, obviously, on the recent period. Uh, but of course, that needs to be mingled with what it is the cost at the trading layer. And that is information we don't have. So I, I think it would be really sound, honestly sound for the authorities, whether it's ESMA, the commission, I don't know, to look at the recent period, even without saying you need to change buy-in or not. I, I don't, but just, I think it's really sound to look at it, to understand what happened. And we can provide part of the figures because we have at them at the settlement layer. But of course, the big impact of the buy is, is at, at, at the trading at the front of it, is, at, is at, at how much profit you can or cannot make on a trade. And that's information we don't have. So the difficulty will be that, that those figures will need to be compiled one way or another, but we are definitely open to, to support such efforts. And I believe mostly it needs to be done for fixed income securities. Because that's where the where the real uh, issue is, I think. Yeah, one of one of the comments on Tuesday from one of the panelists was that CSDIR could cause liquidity to dry up, and and yeah, CMU and liquidity is the title of this panel, and 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 I think you know particularly for people who are market makers who need to, you know, be able to do that for these sort of less liquid securities, um, they could potentially be opening themselves up to. Um, increase costs if they do that activity, um, and you know, will that therefore dry up some of the liquidity? But, but Michael, any any thoughts from you at this point? No, I mean, I think um, look, CSDR is is thankfully, I mean, we, we know it's there, right? I mean, we know the, the goalposts. There is an opportunity now for um, revision or you speak calibration, um, to a certain degree, and obviously with this period, um, there are also opportunities to respond. So I mean, the, the response period was rather short um, in the publication on June 10th, and then there was closure of the consultation period on June 30th. Um, that being said, obviously the industry associations have pushed forward. I think moving um, to the new normal, um, 
with uh, the UK's changing relationship, what we would certainly welcome is that there is, and there also might be based in Frankfurt, um, but with, with the foot still in London, we are obviously um, trying to raise some of the concerns um, from the continental perspective as well that still reflect the, the aspect of um, losing a lot of infrastructure potentially that um, people have taken for accepted over the past couple of years. And um, that sort of balance needs to be made because the fear that we, we have is that policymakers look at this um, potentially and look more with the, the B word in mind as opposed to trying to create the right um, pragmatic approach to uh, key issues on, on financial market infrastructure. I think um, one of the bits that we're certainly missing from, or we've been missing since 1.0 and something that we've been trying to raise awareness on is also on collateral and custody and um, the very different standards that um, exist in the national level. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll spare you the, the, the shameless book plug, but uh, we've, we've been putting out some um, analysis on that and how that ties in with the CSDR. Um, and a number of other acronyms, um, because if you don't if you don't get that right, you, you'll find that liquidity is also an issue with that when you suddenly have a very different standard than what the London market might be used to in a number of jurisdictions, including if you look over the IRC to uh, to Ireland. So there is a lot of there's a lot of work to be done. Um, I think now, as I said, there is a, a unique window of opportunity because of COVID being a catalyst effectively to doing more trying to really use CMU as, as part of helping with this recovery. It just needs a more joined up approach um, with a uh, with a balance of saying, you know, we're not coming to you, the policymaker or the supervisor, with trying to protect the interests of one financial center, but we're coming to you as a cross financial center voice of the industry. And I think ISLA has been doing a great job in doing that. So it'd be great to see others do the same. So Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Um, I want to try to move move through a couple of other topics before uh, before we sort of finish up because the, the time is marching on. Um, so um, one of the other subjects that came up on Tuesday um, and we're talking about liquidity. We just talked about liquidity in the context of CSDR and the implications there. One of the other topics that came up was Basel IV, um, which is a you know obviously a key element to um, to CMU and. The gentleman who was on the panel representing a bank actually came up with some eye-watering numbers as to the impact that Basel IV will have on capital being allocated um, for this activity, security lending and borrowing. Um, and I think the numbers that he threw out was that uh, on his current uh, book of business uh, capital of $15 million was going to get increased to $450 million based upon the, uh, the interpretation of Basel IV. And, and as I think we can all appreciate, um, that's probably going to be um, game changing for uh, banks who are subject to increases in capital costs like that. So um, I was curious, um, and we haven't, we didn't talk about this in our in our preparation session. So not sure how much uh, the you know, the three of you can comment on this, but maybe Michael, if I come back to you in the first instance, um, yeah, you know, that that sort of impact um, without something changing. I know. Basel IV is a 2023 to 2028 um, implementation, so we're a little bit away from it. And there's still work that can be done. But what are you, what are your thoughts initially on on, on those sorts of uh, numbers? Well, I mean the numbers are, uh, as you say, they're eye watering, and I think each each um, bank uh, or securities dealer is looking at what what the impact is for them. Um, and it's not just it's not just Basel IV and the banks. It's also and the investment firms regulation, investment firms directive for um, liquid investment firms, um, whether they're um, bank, uh, bank like and, and may become subject to um, direct uh, supervision of the bank union or not. So, um, you know, IFR, IFD um, has just crept around the corner um, for many, and I think a number of institutions are just throwing their hands up in the air and saying, you know, why, why this? Why now? And why no um, delay um, similar to, to Basel IV? Um, the only thing that we can um, really do with clients, and we are doing already, is a full scenario planning and looking at how one changes um, potentially uh, contractual documentation, policies, procedures, um, but also reaching out to 
um, supervisory teams and say, look, have you have you actually looked at what this does? And does this really, in the interest of um, you know, what Basel IV in the European Union is supposed to be doing, and um, with all of the reliefs, and you know, those reliefs are not repeals, to be quite clear, but with all the reliefs to say that banks and um, systemic um, securities dealers are effectively part of the solution, are these rules really fit for, for purpose? And so that um, that type of engagement is happening now. Um, the, the only thing that we would sort of say is that whilst you know, the supervisors are generally quite receptive of constructive feedback, um, it, the constructive feedback needs to come with a solution, and that's what we're sort of pushing for. Um, I do think that there will be some further tweaking, um, both generally within the banking union, because that's always the way things are done. You have the EU level rules and then you have a tweak within the banking union. Across the non-banking union uh, member states, they will probably follow that. So it will be in you know, phase, you've got, you've got a phased implementation followed by a phased tweaking period. And now sort of the window to sort of say, we scenario plan, this doesn't really achieve the spirit of you know, this new normal post COVID that we're operating in. Um, and how do we do that? And then, of course, you can always throw in um, you know, the, the sort of suggestion to say, well, um, you obviously, you, know, you, the supervisor policymaker, want this business to be done in the EU27. The UK may offer some additional reliefs um, or repeals, for that matter, uh, which makes uh, London more attractive. And, and that also is sort of so it's a fully justified, well, it's a fully justified comment. Um, that these figures sometimes don't make sense in relation to uh, the objective. Sure. And, uh, Tanya, I'll ask you about that um, in a second, just for your thoughts on it. But first of all, just one question that's come in, Michael, very specific, actually, for you. Um, do you see firms repapering documents away from UK law? Um, well, we... Um, <laughs> we so, OK, so we, 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 we don't see a lot of enthusiasm about repapering away from UK law and in many instances um, there is you know there are solutions that you can put in place. Um, we, we talked about this um, a couple a couple times in various different forms. I mean ultimately as a as a financial services market participant you're going to be faced with two major um, pressures. One you have the pressure from the counterparty that will say um, I need to have a law of the EU 27 um, governing my securities financing transaction with you, and then the response to that will be probably, well, yes, but there's no real you know, existing documentation suite that works, and I can't take a Gamisla or a Jimra. Uh, with a Jimra, it's somewhat easier, but with a Gamisla, I can't necessarily translate that over into XYZ. I mean, you can put it into, um, into, a, into a German uh, master agreement for securities lending, but you lose all the optionality and effectively the beautiful drafting of Gamisla. So the solution to that is to say, okay, well, let's take a step back and say we continue to be able to apply, but we'll then put in place um, alternative dispute resolution, um, where usually arbitration or um, expert determination uh, with the seat within the European Union. That is a stopgap for now. The direction for travel, the direction of travel is from the policymakers, not necessarily to say we're going to eliminate the ability to use English law, quite the contrary. It does look at the, um, firstly, investor protection concerns, including for professional clients, um, to say, would, would English law put the counterparty to the dealer entity at any greater disadvantage? And so, um, you know, as, so the Law Society of England and Wales and us, also qualified in Germany and Ireland, but at its heart an English solicitor, so we're obviously raising awareness to say, You've got proven solutions that interoperate with a number of items. Don't change that over the short period of time because that will actually cause financial instability in a period where financial stability is what we're all trying for. So longer term, there is a move for repapering. Um, there is a move generally for repapering because you have to, you have to move entities. But um, I'd say the large part of that is you move entities that you don't change government law and you change uh, dispute resolution venue. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for answering that um, specific point. So, Tanya, if I could just uh, revert back to you just on that Basel IV, um, the, the comments and the discussion we had there. Um, 
I don't know whether any of that feedback um, around the sort of uh, the, the impact of Basel IV has, has reached the Commission. What, what are your thoughts? Um, I'm always confused with uh, with the numbering. Is it Basel III? Is it Basel III plots or Basel IV? <laughs> uh, we have been, we are currently referring to Basel III, but so we can also refer to Basel IV, of course. Um, we we get um, a lot of echo, let's say, from from the banks, investment banks, that um, Basel III or three plus um, is is, is going to impact um, even even more, um, you know, their their ability to market uh, to to make markets to to deal in securities. Um, to, to keep basically securities inventories on their balance sheets. So this is this is something that we hear a lot. Uh, actually, I have discussed this. We we had a couple of banks, or well, more than just a couple, uh, among our members. So the the issue of uh, specifically market making and the ability of investment firms to to actually um, you know support the liquidity uh, have been raised on a number of occasions. And when this discussion emerged. Um, it very quickly uh, became a discussion of really puzzle, puzzle three, you know, different elements uh, in relation to uh, FRTB and in relation to liquidity coverage rate and, and you know, not to mention even risk weights. I mean, uh, everything was interrelated and basically the bank said, uh, listen, there's just not one single element of, of, of puzzle three that, uh, you know, if you, you know, just tweak that one, it, it would be sufficient. It would require, um, you know, um, a, a more comprehensive uh, view, um, let's say, of each and every single, including the evaluation methodology, you know, the use of the standard approach, um, et cetera, you know, uh, including the evaluation of, of derivatives and, um, and all these hedging exemptions and stuff like that. So uh, all of this needs to be uh, considered uh, if we really want to change uh, the situation, want to worsen the current situation with uh, with, with banks no longer no longer making markets. Um, of course, we we wouldn't expect banks to to, to come back uh, in in the same way they. Uh, they were participating in markets before the crisis. Um, there was a lot of talk, um, I think, in in, uh, in various studies that there was a lot of fake liquidity, a lot of exaggerated liquidity that would not be uh, possible to to reproduce or to return to markets. But at the same time, I think we need to be mindful. And um, I think the the Commission is currently working. There was a public consultation on on. Um, Level three implementation, you know, with very detailed questions as to, you know, how the industry sees uh, Basel rules. You know, uh, is is there really a disproportionate impact on on the activity of banks? Um, you know, now we've got a bit more time to uh, to work on on the Basel implementation because ultimately, uh, Marco, you did say that it, it's not Basel rules; it's it's CR, CRD that, that matters, or IFR, IFD that matters because this is. These are the rules that would be, uh, you know, applied by um, by our stakeholders. Um, so I think what is important is really to to first of all for us to see what is the flexibility that is already embedded in Basel rules, and there is some. Uh, and I think um, perhaps too often we we don't use that flexibility to to the maximum. For example, the one of the discussions in the HLF was about uh, you know this. Um, the treatment of speculative uh, venture capital um, and the fact that under the new uh, rules uh, it, it, it should um, it should have a risk weight of 400. Um, they, banks basically said you know that would make it pro prohibitive for us to 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 do anything with this. And uh, as as the definition was not so straightforward, it wasn't even clear that uh, you know in in cases where it, it it really has nothing to do with speculative trading, where where you know banks through structures and there, there was the. Um, uh, one bank that uh, is is part of this, uh, you know, but it's based on this invest investment vehicle where they invest in equity. Um, you know, they 
they said, we don't do short term, we, we don't do speculative, we do long term, you know, it, it's really long term investment. Why, you know, this, uh, you know, this treatment for something which doesn't even go in, you know, along with, with, the, with the objective, because, okay, it's, it's fine to, let's say, punish or restrain the risk of something which is done for speculative purposes, you know, for the quick turnaround of money, that we understand, you know, if we're sitting in a company for five to seven or even more years, it just simply shouldn't apply to us. Uh, and to be honest, um, but having looked at the at the rules, the, the risk flexibility, there is a footnote somewhere in Basel rules that says, you know, it shouldn't apply to you companies with whom banks have long stand, standing relationships. It might not be applicable in all of those cases, but I think it, it's sort of, again, coming back to what I said before, it's, it's about legislative intent. So I think we need to understand what is the intent, what is the objective of those rules, not to necessarily, you know, uh, translate them uh, religiously uh, in in our own uh, rule book, but rather giving it a consideration, thinking, okay, what is the main objective? Because the objective is really to ensure that there is, you know, that risks are contained, that you know there are the right incentives for banks not to take too many, um, you know, too uh, too high risks. Uh, that is a you know an honorable objective. But it, it, are these is this the way to get there? Is it, is it proportionate to get there in, with, with, those, with those means? So, um, I think looking at the flexibility that Basel already allows for in, you know, ensuring that we're using to the maximum this flexibility to um, to avoid the situation that with, with Basel III we, we are, you know, we're impacting the markets in in, in, a, in a such a way that um, you know we, we might not be able to to recover from. Yeah, I think one of the one of the questions that's come in, and I'm conscious we're slightly over time, so we probably have to start wrapping things up. But just one last question here is: is will Europe have to modify elements of Basel three and four in order to remain competitive globally? Um, Michael, any any comment on that? Well, I mean, I think there are there's some aspects, of course, in, in Basel, I mean, Basel three and CR C eighty four as amended by um, CR two C eighty five, right? So um, there's certain aspects which um, are, um, are, are fully embedded. Um, I mean, I think you know, many in many ways um, there's there are. It really depends. I mean, it depends on what what, what we mean with competitive, right? I mean, in many ways, the Europe the European um, view is um, CR two, CR five is the gold standard, and creates um, the, the flexibility for the supervisors to come in as part of um, be it under SSM or under non SSM supervision um, to to move forward. Um, if you were sitting in the United States, you would say, well, look at us, we're far more competitive because we're on Basel you know, 1.5, right, or going on 2. Um, so I, I think it really it depends. Um, you know, there are other things that the Commission can be doing to make the European financial services market more competitive. One of them to come full circle to the CMU is really to drive forward and um, if I might be direct about it, um, to really get the RTS and the ITS um, that are not yet finalized, finalized. I appreciate that there's a lot of um, logistical issues with, with, with COVID, um, but there are, for example, in key areas, a lot of the building blocks that were flagship project, or project to see in the 1.0 note of securitization field that we are still waiting on um, with great frustration to get that done. Um, and you know they're not they're not um, contentious items. Um, the other thing that the high level forum I think in, in support says about bringing the strands together, right? So it's the first time that we've we'll been talking about supervisory convergence for such a long time, but it's very welcome to see. And I think um, DG FISMA under its its current uh, new leadership, so DG FISMA is effectively the closest thing we have at the European level to. Um, you know, H and Treasury in comparison to the UK, or Finance Ministry in other jurisdictions. And um, for the first time, we're saying, you know, this this is the this is the, the European financial markets architecture that we want to build. This is how different parts of, of regulation are interoperable with one another. 
it's also welcome to see that the, the Parliament and the Commission have been going out with um, requests um, for assistance for projects to actually look at um, regulatory convergence. If you get that right, if you really go down the path of saying, um, you know, this aspect of solvency two interoperates with this aspect of CR, and we don't have this gap, then we start to take this patchwork and move to a nice, you know, all-encompassing level playing field. And that's ultimately what we're trying to get to. And if you have that, you've got you've got a competitive or far more competitive Europe um, that will, you know, have to contend with um, other global players. Um, but I think, given it is the largest single market for financial services uh, after the United States, um, it, it certainly offers a number of opportunities. So that's. Uh, Right, maybe through rose tinted um, EU glasses, but that's uh, uh, some, of, some of my views on that. Okay, Tanya, do you share those rose tinted glasses? I, I would love to share <laughs> the rose tinted glasses vision. Um, well, um, perhaps a bit of realism uh, to, to that. As, um, I, I, I think what the forum did was. was honestly perhaps even more than what we would have expected of them so they, they've done a really great job and being very detailed and, and granular and as michael was saying kind of bringing the pieces together you know um and trying to see how they interconnect and and making links uh so that you know we don't have just you know solvency two review or we don't have just you know basel three uh we've got both because ultimately what matters is we we need to bring more institutional investors on both sides and okay, they can be banks they can be insurers but ultimately it's making sure that uh incentives are aligned and and uh we uh, uh we, we, we can support both both sides and and reinforce both sides the problem that we're facing is uh like we did somewhat uh, in 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 cmu 1.0 is uh, okay. Our proposals are, are, are as good as, uh, let's say, um, uh, the, the finally agreed political text. Are. So um, the proposals might be good and ambitious, and um, you know the industry might like them or dislike them. Um, but uh, ultimately, it's, it's what is finally agreed by by the Parliament Council that would make a uh, difference, right? Um, and uh, what we've seen in the past is that, um, you know, we, the, the moment it hits uh, uh, the doors of ju Justice lets us, um, or wherever the Council sits these days, tax do have a tendency to, to change and change a lot. And the national discretion seems to um you know crawl back in one way or another um in some places more than others and i've been personal sitting through through the discussions of a, of a justice flavored um proposal on the accelerated um, extrajudicial recovery of co collateral um and there uh you know it, it's just it, it's very it's very sad to see how you know, the, uh, the the proposal for what is believed to be a harmonization proposal, you know, uh, gets gets undrafted. And then, you know, discretion is being added a bit here, a bit there. Uh, and ultimately, um, you know, the, the tax loses vision, the tax loses, um, I think, that, that important feature of really trying to, to bring these pieces together. And this is what I would personally, this is my personal view, uh, I would like to, to 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 mention perhaps as a as a pinch of salt to to the vision through uh, glass uh, tainted um, sorry uh, uh, pink tainted glasses of Michael um, that you know we we really need to see whether the political backing is there and whether the you know the the uh, lot, lots of slogans that politicians do make are uh, in, in support of of, of the CME, in particular now uh with with covid uh, ravaging and uh, with companies uh, being deprived of, of liquidity or access to, to funding uh that those statements do translate in political support and willingness uh to really uh build the single rule book for 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 capital markets like they've done for 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 banking 
And this will make a difference if, if those technical discussions actually show that there is a will now to work on common rules and on, on, on rules uh, that are not pasted by, by this national discussion. This, this would make a difference. And we're yet to see. Okay. Can I, can I, can I, just, can I just jump in on one, on one thing there for me? And I apologize. I, I do have thick glasses, so it might be that I, uh, I, I sometimes. Um, but now, all jokes aside, I think one of one of the key differences that we've certainly seen over the past six months, as COVID has ravaged, is that um, there is certainly amongst the traditional north-south divide. G Germany, for example, has come pretty much full circle in terms of they, from being somewhat reserved, has um, tried now to become the if you want the tamer in chief of the food before, and um, the, the dynamic is shifting in that sense. So. Um, I think, uh, first of all, COVID, and that you have, for example, um, Wolfgang Schäuble um, being quite pro-European and saying almost to the sense of we need to avoid the mistakes of the past with this uh, watershed moment or Hamiltonian moment in many ways is, is quite shocking. And um, so there, there has been this realization and a change in tune among some of the more staunch um, opponents to more Europeanization. And on the supervisory front, I think the, the, nec the next big test goes to the point, Tanya, that you're making, which unfortunately is the frustration that I also share with once it goes to the, the council that becomes, again, um, somewhat more national, is you know, the, the somewhat um, dropping of the ball, to put it politely, of um, the national competent authority and the certain um, institution uh, that's uh, in, in, in the press um, might mean that um, there is a willingness to actually do more together and stop going away from saying, yes, our national authority needs to do this as opposed to so on and so forth, or our national laws. And the, the, the technical dossier that you mentioned is, of course, a very contentious, um, very important one, of course, but um, I think in some of the more non-contentious CMU deliverables, we should hopefully have traction. And once there is traction, there's, um, there's a move forward. So. Very good. Um we could carry on clearly <laughs> so um we haven't talked about uh, sftr use it short selling i think we could have got it with that uh, last comment michael but um but anyway um there's plenty we could have continued to talk about but thank you very much um for for covering all of that in the in we've, we went a little bit over time um but i would like to thank all the um all the people who've joined us today for uh, staying with us